Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Caleb Chen, Dean of King School of Business, and uh, we want to welcome you. And uh, some of you are required to come. Some of you are saying, wow, I don't want to miss this opportunity. And uh, today we have uh, a guest speaker, uh, Mr. Kurt Richardson, who is an alumnist. And uh, we have two classes, primarily what I represent here. One is the, the finance uh, investment class, and the other is about the business administration, capital course, which is strategic management. And uh, do we have anybody who is not on either of these classes? No, okay. I have a dollar price. I have a dollar price for someone who has an other box. Anybody? Okay, we got one, two, three. You four, okay. Make sure you come to me and you have a safe grant gift certificate for being an owner of an other box case. <laughs> well, uh, we are so privileged to have what uh, Mr. Richardson uh, and his wife, uh, both of them are in our uh, community yesterday and today visiting. And uh, Mrs. Richardson uh, is actually in a different meeting. But uh, we have asked for the, uh, Mr. Richardson to come and share with us his experiences, his wisdom, his insight. And uh, I'm not going to steal any thunder. And I think what uh, you probably have read up on Mr. Richardson's bio and uh, being a founder and chairman of a great company that's called Arthur Products and employees at a company that called what? Does anybody know? Others. All right. Who said that? Okay. Well, come claim you have the gift certificate too. <laughs> so we're giving out some door prizes today. But what uh, the, the wonderful part of uh, having this session today is what uh, we are going to engage in some dialogues, and that's why we also want to welcome all. Uh, Two wonderful the professors, what the Dr. Randy Lewis and also Dr. Gary Britton. So that would you help me welcome all of this uh, wonderful people, Mr. Richardson and our professors, to be part of the panel. So I'm going to tell, this, tell you students, I haven't ever told you guys this story. We were in Chicago, and uh, I had an iPhone 5S, and um, I was taking pictures with it. had an Otterbox cover. Beautiful one. I think I paid, I don't know if you got 80 bucks, 100 bucks if you're in the... Uh, yeah, whatever. Anyway, I was, uh, I, I took some photos, and then five minutes later, I'm, I'm, I'm realizing my, my phone's gone. It's not in my pocket anymore. And, so I'm, you know, I did, you know, try to locate my phone with the, the little app that's on your, on your, on your Apple phone, and I said to my wife, I said, I can't believe they, they, they stole that to get my iPhone, and she said they didn't steal it because your iPhone, they wanted your OtterBox. <laughs> that's a true story too. Uh, so I lost my OtterBox. Anyway, uh, Kurt, um, we talked about an IPO. Uh, what kind of advantage or disadvantage that might be for a company like yours. And in, in case you don't know what an IPO is, you should all know what it is, but in case you don't, it's an initial public offering. And that would be, that would be, well, that would essentially mean that this company would go public. And my question is, you know, what, what would be the advantages or disadvantages for a company like yours to, uh, to go with an IPO as opposed to stay private? <coughs> Sure. Well, yeah. As a family-owned business, you know, you you go. Well, how do I um, how do I get some of my equity out of this thing? Because as a family, you know, it's it's like 95% of our net worth, OtterBox. And uh, the only way to ever really do anything like that is there's a couple ways. 
you could do a private equity sale. So you could sell a minority to a private equity company. You could sell a majority to a private equity company with the long-term play being they're going to take that IPO. Um, both have benefits, or you could just do an IPO, which is really the only way you're ever going to get fair market value is what will the market pay for it. You know, with, uh, with a private equity, you're always looking at, you know, what kind of uh, multiple are they going to pay on EBITDA, and, and uh, then you're arguing about EBITDA. <laughs> you know, so, uh, and I've, I've looked at the private equity route and uh, went down that road ways and then called it off. Um, just didn't feel comfortable with those firms. Didn't feel comfortable with where it was going. And um, and even in one case of one that I really liked, they were just flat afraid of, of Otter in a way because Otter had grown so quickly over the last you know seven eight years. I mean, you've gone from quarter million in revenue to 1.1 billion in revenue. Um, it's, it's will it be able to sustain that? Those are the kinds of questions they're asking. You know, can you hold this kind of EBITDA, or is that going to go down over time? Is, it, is the fact that now the case is a commodity um, in the marketplace, the market is starting, certainly starting to, to flatten out a little bit as everybody has an iPhone, but the volume is still huge. I mean, we do 250,000 cases a day. That's a lot of, a lot of cases over a year. Um, but are you going to be able to sustain that? Can you continue to hold your market share? Between OtterBox and LifeRoof, we have over 50% of the market. So um, really the only way to get fair market value would be an IPO. Now that a lot of strings come attached with an IPO, you know, your accounting is totally different. I think it changes the mentality of how you run your business. You know, you're working for the street. You're always worried about the next, the next, uh, quarter, the next month, you know, your earnings report, you're always talking to analysis. So you have different people, you have a different group of people in here that have to run your company as well. So it, it is a totally different animal, and it's, I'm not sure it's an animal that I would like, you know, I would, I, I personally, now I, I stepped down as CEO four years ago, we have a great CEO and a great group of executives in place at Otter to run that company. But it's, that's a tough question. It's, it really comes down to at what point do you want to, I don't know so much cash out, but at what point do you want to take some of your money off the table? Okay. Along those same lines, well, along those same lines, um, as a Christian organization, that has to look pretty large when you're thinking about uh, selling a portion uh, of your family to someone else. Uh -huh. uh, Without putting you on too much of a spot, how much did that enter into this decision? We had all the financial end of it and all the hassle and inconvenience and the answering to other people and all of that. But um, other people are going to be having opinions about whether or not you're doing uh, the right thing and you're thinking I'm doing what the Lord wants and how are they going to react to that? Well, all I really care about is what the Lord wants. I don't really care what other people think. <laughs> so, <laughs> to give, as, as an entrepreneur, I mean, that's. And as a, as a follower of Jesus, I mean, that's really all that matters to me. You know, and, and really a big part of the whole private equity thing, I'll be straight up with you, we were, we were going forward with the private equity thing, and me and Nancy prayed, Lord, you know, if this is not what you want, kill it. Shut it down. Next day, bam. And they were going full, full blast, and just shut down. And I'm just like, Okay, well, that's an answer to prayer. So, you know, it's, it's, it's walking with Jesus and really going, what do you want? You know, and that's, that's really where both of us are at even today. So if it's an IPO, if it's a sale, it's not going to happen without his blessing. So. Uh, you uh, mentioned earlier when we were talking about uh, what you call iterations of the business, um, different versions, different uh, expressions of what you were doing. Can you describe that process? Uh, people had... Uh, basically characterized what you had done as an overnight success. Of course, it wasn't. It was 30 plus years. Right. right. And you went through a lot of different uh, versions of what you were doing between then and now. Uh, could you describe those ones? Sure. Uh, I mean, Otter really started out back in 1981 as a tool and die company. So I'm a tool and die maker by trade. 
injection mold makers. So I was in the plastics industry, building molds for IBM, Hewlett Packard, you know, Mattel, all different kinds of plastic parts. And um, started out just as a small tool shop, me and one other guy, and it grew. And then, it, it, then I hit a wall, I hit a ceiling, and went back to the garage. I always said, you know, I did go bankrupt three times, I just went back to the garage three times. So I, I had to recreate myself, but I also had to look inside and go, well, why is this happening? Why am I failing? What is happening here to make me not be able to scale? Make me work lots of hours? And, uh, and I, I slowly, my education came from reading books. My idea was from a vacation with seven business books on the beach. You know, and I was able to take a lot of that back and then create systems and processes. But it wasn't until I understood that a business was systems. A business is systems, and people run those systems. So you have to create systems within the business itself that run the business and then train the people to run those systems. People go, well, isn't that making everybody kind of robotic? Well, not really. It's very freeing when your employees don't have to come to work every day and recreate their job. They understand what their job is, they understand their expectations. So there's systems throughout the whole business. Now I will say that as you get bigger, and where Otter is today, 1,200, 1,200 people globally, um, systems can become bureaucratic. So you can over-systematize. And I think we've kind of gone there at this point. You know, it's not as entrepreneurial as it used to be. And it, it's, people, Otters always come to me and go, well, it's not what it used to be when you were here. I go, well, well, you aren't what you were when you were junior high either. You know, so businesses grow up, people grow up. It's, it really isn't any different. Everything has a life cycle. When you, uh, as a Christian business, I want to kind of follow up on Gary's question a little bit, but as a Christian business, um, when you look at growth, expansion, um, do you view that, do you think any differently as a Christian business? In, in debt, um, as a Christian business, as maybe a secular business? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'll say Otter is not a Christian business. I am a follower of Jesus. Okay? So I don't want to mix those up. I don't want to turn my, I'm not turning there to turn my business into a church. But I, what I do want is I want myself to reflect the person of Jesus. And then that's going to be part of, of the culture of Otterbox. Now, we have a lot of believers that work at Otterbox. We have a lot of people that are not believers at Otterbox. Jesus didn't hang out with a bunch of believers. He hung out with a bunch of sinners. And, and that's really what I believe. Now, I have had friends that have been fellowship companies for Christ and other things like that. And uh, I've seen it a train wreck. I really have seen a train wreck uh, when you... When, when they try to really turn their business into a ministry. It's like, no, I'm a business, I'm here to make money, and, and, I, and, and I hold no, nothing back about that. But I'm also here to give. I'm also here to give back. I believe to whom much is given, much is expected, and those are many of the values we try to infuse within OtterBox, through Otter Cares, through many of the things we do in the community, and uh, through Kingdom Investing. So as a family, we're very much about investing in God's kingdom and where is he leading us to invest and, and Otter's part of that. But uh, um, we certainly, I, I want people to see Jesus in me, I want people to see Jesus in my family, Jesus in, in many of our employees, and then that gives us the opportunity to share Christ. Well then, then what, maybe uh, a different question is, what, um, how do you feel about debt? Uh, are you conservative with regard to debt, to grow, grow through debt? Yeah, I, I, I have been. Um, up until a few years ago, we, we really had no debt. Otter has a huge line of credit. We've never got into our line of credit. I did go to, I, when, you, when you start getting a company that's worth so much, it's like, how do you take some of that off the table and start to invest that you know, in for future uh, generations in your family? So I did go to the street, raise money, pull money out, that's great basically, and then pay down that debt. And that's just another way of getting capital out of your, out of your business. So. 
you mentioned the systems within the company and uh, describe yourself as tool and die makers. So uh, unlike a lot of startups, the manufacturing end didn't scare you at all, I'm sure. Right. Uh, how much of the various functional areas in the, in the value chain do you actually do from uh, original procurement uh, processes all the way to after sales service, if there's any such thing, uh, manufacturing, marketing, uh, distribution, those sorts of things? How much of that do you actually cover and how do you make those decisions? Sure. Um, well, real quick, let me go back to the debt. I don't like debt. I don't like debt. I don't like answering to the banks because they drive me nuts. You know, I really, so as, as I borrow as little as I need to. Yeah, yeah, that answer. Yeah, yeah, and, and not owing is a great, I'm friends with Dave Ramsey, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. um, now, your question is what do we, what do we as an organization do? Um, so we strategically said, or I strategically said, I am not going to manufacture anymore, and that was in 2001. So I was a manufacturer. Um, that's our roots. Um, we still very much control the supply chain. Now, as there was a time when I had no clue what supply chain was. I thought, well, I'm just ordering stuff, you know. Well, I found out the hard way what supply chain is, and now we have a huge department of supply chain. So it's, Supply chain is one thing we very much do control. Quality engineering is one thing we control. Uh, manufacturing engineering, design, marketing, sales, those are all core competencies that we keep within Otterbox, PR, uh, social media, our internet, website, uh, distribution. We do do our own distribution. A lot of people go, well, why do you do distribution? Well, I really want to be the last one to touch the product before it gets to the customer. So, to me, that's always been important. Is that the wisest thing? Yeah. That may change. Change is always happening. So, but uh, customer service is another thing we do. <coughs> probably eighty percent in house. Maybe twenty percent we we off, offload. Twenty percent of our customer service. So we do a lot of core competencies within our box. Certainly, our accounting and finance and all that is done internally. We talked earlier about uh, about um, how you are able to maintain a premium pricing model, and I know this is outside my area, as most of you know, I'm finance, but I'm going to get into uh, Alan Knight's area of marketing. Uh, but it, it's you know I, I perceive Otterbox <coughs> as a premium priced, high you know top end that you know top end value product, um, and yet you're able to maintain that. That high market share you talked about over, I think you said over half the market share yeah. between the two. And I'm sure a lot of a lot of people are wondering how you're able to do that. Can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I was very intentional up front. Um, one thing is we created that place in the market. I mean, AT and T. Uh, when we first went to AT and T with our Defender case, we said we want this to be 49.95, and they're like. You're crazy. He's got to buy a 49.95 case. Well, so we did a test market in like 20 states, and it wasn't a month in. They're like, "You're going nationwide. We'll take all you can make." And I had a supply chain problem. It was like that UPS commercial, you know, where you're sitting there and you watch the spinner, one order, two order, three order, and that's pretty much how it happened. And, and that can be a nightmare. Believe me, it can be when you don't have enough tooling. Your supply chain, we were flying two L1011s a day in Denver, and this was this was eight years ago. So, you know, it was a, it was a major supply chain deal, but we created that, that and even today, you know, we've got cases now that are 129.95. So, and looking at a case that would be over $300, uh, a high-end case. So, um, people want that, and, and one reason they want it is, you know, Verizon, these guys, they don't make any money on that phone. They're not making any money on the phone at all, hardly. So they're making their money with accessories. So they are pushing us, make a more expensive case, make more expensive, because they want more margin. They want to upsell every time you come in and buy a phone. So um, the market is now pushing the price to go higher on cases as well. So, um, but we've been able to sustain that, and we've actually proven that it works really well. Now I'm always looking at the multiplier. I don't know how many of you guys talk about that in finance, but 
when I look at a product or somebody brings a new product says we have a new case, I'm like, well, what's the cost of goods? And then what's your MSRP? Because I, I like to see at least a 7X from COG to MSRP. So um, we've got some products that are 10, 12. So, and that's, I mean, that fuels growth, that fuels cash. I mean, that's, people go, well, that's unheard of. Well, I'm like, well, I never heard any difference, so that's what we do. Seven or 10 times cost. Um, seems like that would be relatively attractive to potential competitors. I have a lot of competition. Yeah, uh, who's gaining on you and, and what do you do about that? Well, we, first of all, uh, I have a whole fleet of patent attorneys. So very early on, <laughs> I patented everything. Nobody can make it the vendor case. There's nobody in the market that can make a waterproof case. Um, so virtually, we own that. Those, some of those spaces within, within there. And that was very intentional. Spent a lot of money up front on patents. We have, uh, and literally, I, I have a fleet of lawyers that work for me. And we litigate, we, we prosecute, we defend, and we have them lost. So um, we protect our space vigorously. What if the threat comes from someplace that the lawyers can't get to, China or something? We have people in prison in China. Okay. <laughs> hey, you put people are friends of yours. We put there. Okay. Yeah. So, they, so they, they cooperate. We, we actually, the last, the last, we got rid of a factory in China because we heard they were making otter boxes. And they went in there and they said, we won't make otter boxes. We won't, they make all of our competition. They copy all the competition, they, but they won't copy otter boxes. Because they know we'll go after them. So, I was like, I just got one the other day. Some guy sent me my whole line and said, we can sell you copies of OtterBox. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> send it to you? Well, I sent it to my lawyers. They said, they, well, they'll send in people to investigate in China. So, oh, so <laughs> bad email. Don't spam. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd like to cross your friends. <laughs> um, other than that, how has the uh, competitive environment changed uh, since you began? Uh, yeah. Is it pretty stable or are things moving? Do you see well, I don't know. Do I think we can gain more market share? Probably a little bit of market share, but the problem is we become, our customers like Verizon and Best Buy and Walmart, they become a very concerned about us because we're a huge part of their revenue. So, you know, are we scalable for them? Is there, is, are they vulnerable? They look at Autobox in some ways as a risk, not an opportunity when we own that much of the market. So your customers start to look at you a little different. Um, is there competition? Sure, there's always a new competitor. I mean, that's where LifeProof came from. Um, basically, they stepped on a whole bunch of our patents. We got into tons of litigation with them, and finally, I just said, fine. You know, they were gaining market share. They were doing a good job. They designed a good case. They really did. And but it was on the back of our patents. And uh, so, at the end of the day, we bought them, and it was a good buy. It was the right thing to do. So could that happen again? Certainly as you grow as a company, you can't continue to just innovate internally. You have to start to look through acquisition as, as a way to grow your business. So, is there more acquisitions in the horizon? There could be. Um, we've looked at battery cases. The problem with like Mophie, um, you know, they're, they just don't have margin. I mean, they're, they have a high cost of good and they don't have the multiplier that I like. Okay, now we're going to get into something a little different. I think this is an area you're really going to like to discuss. Uh, that is uh, otter care. Uh, a lot of, I don't think any of the students know, or very few would know, what otter care is and why that's different than most businesses, what you're doing with otter care, quite a bit different. Um, and could you just explain what otter care is and, and, and why that's important to you? Sure. You know, the whole idea of giving back. You know, me and Nancy can have that philosophy. We can have that philosophy as a family, but how do we instill that in our culture? I mean, culture is a whole other conversation within a company. But that, in order to do that, you've got to have action. So what we did to launch Otter Cares is we gave everybody in the company $200, and we said, over the next three weeks, we want you to grow this. 
We want you to grow it as much as you can, and then we want you to give it to a local nonprofit, and we'll, you, you can take the check over there and give it to them. And uh, what was so cool about it was they raised a ton of money. So I think we raised well over $100,000 the first time we did it. And the last time we did it, I think it was over a half a million. But um, the beauty was it wasn't so much in giving to the nonprofit. It was the change in the otters that was what was so significant. It was that there was people, non-believers, believers, that had never given. You know, they had not experienced that it was better to give than to receive. So again, godly principles and still put into practice within a business teaches a lot of life lessons. So for us, that was so important and uh, so cool to see that change. I mean, I, I can give you one example, which is great. Uh, there's, there's, you might look this up sometimes, it's called Respirate Haiti. Well, there was a young lady that was down there, and she was uh, she was working in uh, in Haiti, and she had uh, she started a school, a feeding program. Well, one of our otters went down there, and uh, he he helped, just went down to help. Well, he got all gaga over her, you know. So uh, they came back, and she was raising money, and uh, she, he brought her back to Fort Collins, and, and his name is Josh, and. Uh, and uh, we went out to dinner with him, and um, I basically told Josh, you know, I can tell your Twitter page here. You know, <laughs> you need you need to go to Haiti. And I said, if you don't quit otter, I'm gonna fire you. <laughs> <laughs> so he left, and now they're married, and they've adopted uh, four Haitian kids, and their program is amazing. They're built at K through 12 now. They have a library. They're building a hospital. They feed well over a thousand kids every weekend, and uh, it's one of the things we support as a family and through otter care and through some of these programs. Now, a lot of the otters that raise money during the G3, which is that give it, grow it, uh, give it away, they uh, a lot of that money goes to that that organization. So it, we've seen numerous things like that happen. But again, it's the it's the change in people's hearts that are so amazing. But we do see things of total life changes. Well, another thing we do for our otters is after they've been with us a year, we give them what's called a life plan. So they get to go and they spend two days with a, a life planner. This is a process. You can look this up. It's called the Pat Patterson Center .com. And it's all about uh, strategic planning. We use this within Otter as a strategic planning system. We don't do business plans within Otter. We do strategic plans that are living, growing, working every day plans, but we also have this for life, for a life plan. So when when young people or anybody with an otter's been there a year, they can go do a life plan. And we've had people up and quit after they've done a life plan, which is great because it's really, it's about the person, it's about them understanding what they really want and where they really want to go and what their gifts are. And uh, so it, that's that's another part of, of otter care is getting back our culture at all. What happens if that person happened to be somebody who was really important to the organization and really couldn't afford to lose that person? Well, how would you do that? Uh, it would be tough to swallow, wouldn't it? Or not? It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It, we, we've, uh, you know, people usually go through that process early on and they discover what they really want and where they're headed. And we also, you know, an organization grows and it outgrows people. You know, Jim Collins always says, you know, get the right people on the bus, get them in the right seats, and you can go just about anywhere. Well, at some point, you know, the trip outgrows some people. It's time for them to get off the bus. You know, sometimes you've got to open the bus and kick them off the bus. <laughs> and uh, to give them a life plan at that point is also a real gift. And uh, you, can, you can let people go with grace and dignity. And, the, and that's the way it should be. It should never be a surprise when somebody has to get off the bus. Along that line, Deb, have you uh, ever considered going through that before you actually hire somebody, some sort of intensive testing of that sort of thing? Yeah, we have. And, you don't and, have to kick them off and, the bus that way. Right, right, right yeah. The first and, we, and we might do that in some special instances, but uh, we, have, we haven't done that.
do you have any, I'm going to put you on the spot a bit here, um, any things that, that uh, regress, things that, gee, I wish we had done those things differently or sooner or later or not at all or uh, anything like what might have been? Well, I, I, I don't know about regrets. I think there's, there's things that I look back on uh, my life that I wish I'd have known sooner. I mean, you know, I think one of the things that um, I would have loved to have been, at least the question poised to me, is what do you really want? You know, I don't think many people ask that question of themselves, nor do they give themselves permission. Because maybe their parents all along have been telling them what they ought to want, even when they're 60 and their parents have been dead 20 years. You know, I mean, it's true, it happens. I mean, I see it in some of my relatives that, you know, they, they did up until the day they die what their dad expected them to do, and they never did what they wanted. So, I think it's really important that we ask ourselves, what do we really want? And I'm not talking about material things here. I'm talking about a deep dive into who you are, who you're meant to be, you know, what, what's God putting on your heart? You know, and, and you know, you guys know how to ask yourself those questions. A lot of people don't have those tools. So to be able to give people those tools, and I was give, I was really given some of those tools when I was about 40. Well, I wish I had got them when I was about 25. Would have been really helpful, you know, or even younger to even start asking that question: What do I really want? It, it really kind of helps you get going in the right direction. You guys. Very few of you are going to be very pinpointed. You're not going to go, well, there's the bullseye. That's exactly what I want. Because that's going to change over time. But if you start to figure out who you are, what you really want early on, you know, what do you, what do you want? When you breathe your last breath when you're 96, okay, I'll give you that much time. <laughs> do you want to go, oh, that was a great life with. That was awesome. You know, slide right in the hole. I'm good. You know, I'm on to the next life. You know, I'm on to the next, next, next thing with Jesus. And I, um, and, but to have regret at that age to go, ah, that, that really wasn't that good. That, that, you know, that kind of sucked. You know, well, why, why have yourself in that position? You know, so to really be able to ask yourself, what do I really want? understand that about who you are, I think is, a, is an amazing gift to be able to have. So we try to do that, and the life plan really does that. It helps people understand who they are, and what they're there for, and what their, you know, some of those stage gates, those turning points in their life to be able to go, that's, that's it helps them make good decisions. I can see that we have probably a lot of students here that, that would find your company really appealing. On the other hand, uh, the the idea that you're an entrepreneur is it's kind of in your DNA, and I kind of look at it like you may have it, you either have it or you don't have it. And I think there's probably some students out in the audience that that probably have that in their DNA, and mm -hmm. some that don't. Um, could you give them advice? Number one, I guess, could you give them advice in terms of how to kind of determine if it's in your DNA, and what? Um, if, they, if it's not in their DNA, what, uh, what would you advise them uh, to do in terms of job search? Yeah. Well, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just who you are, you know, who you were created to be. And uh, so, it, you know, a lot of people go, well, I'm not an entrepreneur, so I can't start a business. Well, that's not true at all. I think there's very much so uh, a thinking wavelength of people, and there's a risk wavelength. And where do you fit on that? Are you high risk? Are you low risk? You're real low risk, you know, and what, what interests you? I mean, you can kind of look at your personality and go, who am I as a person? I mean, if, if, you're, if, if you're very risk adverse, you know, you're, you're, you, you probably aren't starting a business. But it doesn't mean you can't play a key role in business. One thing I learned, I mean, I'm a risk taker all the way. Life is boring without risk for me. You know, everything's about risk. <coughs> So, high risk, high reward. I like that. Is there failures? Sure, there's failures. Learn from it, get over it, move on. You know, but a lot of people can't do that. But you have to have, you have to, as an entrepreneur, you have to surround yourself with people that understand who you are. So, if you're not an entrepreneur, at least understand who an entrepreneur is, 
because you may be the CEO of one of this company. I have a guy right now who is not an entrepreneur, but he is an operation guy. I mean, he he's about metrics, he's about rewards, he's about understanding, you know, everything that the customer needs. That's not necessarily who I am, and that's why I'm not the CEO of a billion dollar company, because I don't want to be. Now, I own it, but I don't want to run it. So, you know, there's there's lots of positions there that are great positions to back up those entrepreneurs or you were always looking for entrepreneurial thinking within different departments whether it's sales or you don't really want entrepreneurial thinking in accounting but <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, so but but in different parts of our supply chain places like that we're always looking for leaders that are very thinking out of the box how do we do this different how do we do it better how do we uh, affect the bottom line. How do we make a difference on the P and L? So, so do you? Uh, would they go to your website if they were interested in a position with Outerbounds? Uh huh. Yeah, and we have positions listed there and internships. I can. Uh, I'll get you guys some information on that. If people want to do interns, we've had a lot of interns. Uh, my son went to Plymouth State in New Hampshire, and uh, we had quite a few interns come from there and. And they, a lot of them have stuck, and some of them have grown and moved on to other jobs, and yeah, done their own. So, I think we should probably give some time for questions from the audience. But, right, Gary? I think it's not Dr. Chan here someplace. Okay, here comes Dr. Chan right now. Ah, <laughs> uh, just that. Uh, I'm going to take the mic. Well, if you have a question, but uh, feel free to then uh, raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. And the first person gets a prize! <laughs> oh! <laughs> Surprises. Oh my god. Thanks. <laughs> Alright. I oh, kind of have two questions. First is, like, it seems like a lot of your products are dependent on, like, the iPhone. Um, does that scare you, number one? And then the second question is, like, are you opening, do you have, like, products for, like, the iPad and the other iPhone products like that? Yeah, um, we're, we're always going to be dependent on the market leader. So right now, really, in reality, there's two phones. There's the iPhone and Samsung. Yeah. So um, we do make products for all the iPads and some of the Samsung product pads as well. So we're always going to cover technology and enable a mobile world. So I mean that's that's our mission. And uh, so yeah, I, do I like being dependent on Apple? Apple's the hardest one of all to work with. <laughs> you know, we yeah. we have to get all of our data, our information on how to build a case off the internet. Although they're getting they're getting ready to do a partner program. Unlike Samsung, Samsung, we're we're actually in their labs in Korea right now. Uh, designing around their product. You know, we hope to get there with Apple, but Apple's just now figuring out that they have to do that with other with other partners. They got to play a little nicer in the market. Thank you. Uh, okay, so basically, obviously, like being an entrepreneur, you're going to face like challenges and lows. Like, what was like your lowest point in like kind of this journey to owning a billion dollar company? Yeah. Well, there's been multiple lows, so yeah. it hasn't just been one. You know, I can I can tell you one specifically. I was importing molds from Poland, and uh, Poland built great molds. I was over there two years, and I was building tools for Mattel and Ford Motor Company, all different technology companies, and uh, they just couldn't hit a lead time. Well, lead times are just incredibly um, important in our world, and uh, you know you don't get to market with the product because of one plastic part, you're looking pretty bad. And I finally discovered I, I could not do business in Poland. I had to get out of Poland. So basically I had to shut down the business <coughs> and go back to the garage. So that's what I did. So I but so I can specifically remember closing that thing down, laying everybody off, going, I gotta go start over. So that was a low. You know, I think about two thousand four was a low for me, just trying to get out of the PDA world and you know, it was kind of between PDAs and smartphones and going, yeah, I'm, I mean, I got, I've taken angel money, I've got angel money coming in to help me get this thing 
going? Am I going to fail? I mean, it just seemed like I was just teetering on profitability, not profitable. It was just, it was, it was a painful time. So yeah, I can, yeah, there's, there's plenty of that as well. So I don't want to do that again. <laughs> How was 2008, 2009 for you? Awesome. <laughs> I'm a kid that was a killer. Um, we, uh, people were buying smartphones, but they couldn't afford to break them. <laughs> uh, it was the best insurance policy out there. So we grew, uh, we were on the Inc. 500, I think four or five times in a row, or an Inc. 100 once. <clears throat> So our growth was unbelievable through that time period. Yeah, it was, it was, you'd have thought it would be bad, but it was, it was awesome. So, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so it's great. Give a lot of glory. Um, so phones over the years have kind of become more durable in, the, in themselves, like with the droids and the Samsung, you know, they're showing how they're somewhat water resistant and everything. Um, do you think that that's going to affect Otter at all, or are you more relying on the fact that they gain a lot of their revenue from your accessories that you give them? Well, first of all, Samsung probably won't say a phone is water resistant again, because people like to go swimming with it, and it doesn't work very well. Life, so. um, yeah, water, water resistant, waterproof, that's a scary thing to say. Um, and because people take it, well, I can go scuba diving with my phone. Well, it doesn't work anymore after that. And, and it, you know, just drop the iPhone. You see how tough it is. Yeah, it blows up really well. So I, I really appreciate them making fragile phones. I, now, will they get tougher? Um, they could. They could. And that's a risk. It's always a risk that people, but at the same time, people like to customize their phones with cases. So it's kind of part of their accessorizing, you know, their electronics. So, I mean, that's another, I don't see that changing in the next three to five years. Could that change someday? Yeah, it could. And that's why I look at, well, do you do an IPO? Do you do a PE? Do you pull some of that off the table? And, and do, you, do you leverage up and pay down, leverage up, pay down, pull money out? So, lots of different things. So cool. uh, uh, Avalanche. Oh. <laughs> uh, used to be good. Uh, I, have, I have a question about the first phone that you created a case for. Which model was it? Uh, it was the Blackberry. I think it was the 8500. 8500. 8500. Yeah. So that was really the first. The Blackberry was the first phone we made. Because I don't want around. I have a question that pertains to leadership. And since what the business school uh, is known for equipping leaders to serve. And uh, I have been reading uh, on leadership books that assess what the, some of the traits of effective leaders include high energy and high stress tolerance. So can you comment on the two traits and the how do you rate on those? High energy and high stress. Well, I think I think stress tolerance. Yeah, yeah. I think I think leadership. Uh, first of all, a lot of CEOs thrive on, um, I would say, somewhat chaos. I mean, um, or entrepreneurs do. Um, but I think CEOs too have to be able to handle lots of change because the one thing that's constant is it's going to be change especially in today's world. Um, so I, I think a good CEO needs to be able to handle that. I think the characteristics of a leader um, boil down to one thing, and that's, do people follow? You know, I mean, there's your best litmus test. Is anybody running up behind you when you're trying to take the hill? Are people are gonna follow you? So, and, and I see that a lot, is there's CEOs out there that you know, they're, they're working against their culture. They're not growing a culture. They're not growing their people. And, and really, your biggest asset in your business is your people. And if you're not, if you're not uh, mentoring, if you're not setting it up in a 
in a culture that is conducive to people growing and advancing and, and getting ahead, then uh, I think people are not going to follow you. They're not going to believe in your vision. They're not going to follow it. Good advice. Thank you. Um, what would you say your company's um, greatest distinctive competency is, and do you think that it's sustainable? What was the last part? I'm sorry. Do you think that it's sustainable? Well, I think it's sustainable because we've built systems and processes around that. Um, I think that that is probably one of its strongest points with OtterBox is, and why we're ahead of our competition is because from tooling to supply chain to all of the different uh, things that have to happen on a daily basis within Otter, we've made them scalable through s systemically putting processes around them. Um, and I think a lot of our, com I know a lot of our competition can't scale like we scale, um, even from just how we build our molds and the systems we've wrapped around building molds. I mean, to build, we build, uh, for, I know for the iPhone 5 launch, we build almost 1,200 molds. Now, I don't know if you know what a mold is or what it takes to build a mold, but there's a lot to it. And uh, so to be able to do that um, in a constant way, and we have to do that once to twice, to, well, at least four to five times a year when you look at Samsung and Apple and the watches and all the different iterations and then all the colors and all the different models that we make. So we don't just launch with a Defender case. We have a, commuter, we have a symmetry, we have a life proof, we have a life proof battery case coming out. I mean, so we have all these different products that launch around one phone. The tooling is huge. The design is huge. I mean, we've got a whole tower full of engineers. So we have a whole 3D printing lab. We've got six 3D printing machines and rapid prototyping and, and all that. So to be able to scale that, is uh, the, the, I think the biggest competency that we put into place is we're really able to do that and constantly do that. So I hope that helps. Okay, so my question is kind of going off what you just said. I've always had an outer box because I dropped my phone off the time. And when I first bought it, uh, there weren't really any styles to choose from or any color options. And so I've been in the market looking at your website and you actually do have more options. So is that something you're going to continue to look into, or how, yeah. how are you going to go? Yeah, we're, 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 when you look at the, like, the new symmetry line of cases, I mean, they're very much built around fashion, thin, but at the same time, protection. We're not, we, 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 protection is what Otter stands for. So for us, you know, that's a key thing, is making sure that uh, we're always protecting the device. You know, the, the case may break, that's okay, I just don't want your phone to break. You can call customer service and send you new case. So, so, but yeah, fashion is becoming more and more critical. But it's funny though. Even in the early days, we did a survey, and we had more women buying our cases than men. So it was, it was great. Although and then the real tree came along, and that just smoked everything. South of the Mason Dixon line, we own the South. So when it comes to real tree, yeah. <coughs> Um, some of us are in the business forecasting class here, um, and we've talked about how utilizing the forecasting to separate yourself among the best of the best companies. So I was just kind of curious on how Otterbox is, or how Otterbox company utilizes forecasting. It's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> We're not alone. You know, when you think of the magic pill, call me. Because, I mean, we've gotten better over and over the years, yeah, but, uh, to say we've mastered forecasting, but no, here's part of the problem, is our customers don't even know what they want. You know, so we, we go to Verizon and, you know, well, Verizon would say we're gonna launch this new case for iPhone in these flowery colors, and uh, they go, well, we only want 5,000 of these. We deliver 5,000, gone like that, we want 20,000 of them. Well, these things just don't magically appear. You know, it's like, you know, and they want them tomorrow or yesterday. So, I mean, forecasting is tough because you don't always know what the consumer is. So what does the consumer want at the end of the day is what is going to drive it. Um, but figuring that out is really a science. Um, 
I mean, if you ever figure that out, you really got something. So software is the right thing, but it's the data that you put into it. You know, how do you collect the right data? And it's always changing. It's always fluctuating. There's always the new thing, too. So, well, I wish I could answer that really <laughs> concisely, but I can't. But we, we, we've, we've failed forward a lot with forecasting. Uh, I have a 75 horse grinder that I ground a lot of product out there. How's that? <laughs> All right, Chris, we have a 26 students in the forecasting class. So it might be about that. We can put our minds together and then offer some uh, strategies for you. <laughs> you know, if you want to focus on that and come do an internship, you call me. <laughs> and Tim didn't know that about that, he just won the prize yeah. <laughs> for asking a forecasting question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are down to our last few minutes, but uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? Um, where did the inspiration for your Otter box come from? Like the name? Where did you settle on Otter? Okay, I get asked this all the time, and I got to give all the credit to my wife here because that's that's who came up with the name. Um, we, when we first came out with boxes, we were competing against Pelican, Pelican products. You may have heard of that big cases. They and they didn't make any small cases back then. They made, they made just big ones. So when we came out with them, they would they would laugh at us at trade shows. But then we started eating away at their revenue on the small side. And uh, Pelican makes a great case. They still own that market today. And uh, they bought up a lot of the competition in the case market. So um, they do a great job with cases. We call them the dirty birds. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we, um, we needed a name that competed with that, really. So we are looking for something that was fun and around the water. And what's more fun to watch in the water than not. So that's where it came. she came up with that and was, our box was born. And the year was 1998, right? Yeah, 98. I nobody asked this question, so I'm going to ask it. It's going to be really—it's a really dumb question, but I love dumb questions. So, <laughs> do you think that the Apple Watch will require a case? Because people spend ten thousand dollars on a watch, and they don't want it to get dinged up. I just don't know how you would design a case around an Apple Watch. Someone, someone will make a little snap cover that goes over it. Um, I, I, I think Apple won't because they don't like to cover anything. And we're just now designing cases with Apple. But uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. Uh, we've talked about it, and we may. I'm sure somebody's designed something in the tower for it, you know. But it's, it's probably a, a just a stamp over cover. I mean, you certainly don't want a defender on there. It's going to be about that, <laughs> you know. So, or a lightproof case. It doesn't need to be waterproof. So, um, <coughs> yeah. I don't you know. appreciate what the uh, what the uh, uh, just did. So I have a dumb questions. <laughs> <laughs> dumb professors ask dumb questions, <laughs> <laughs> or they're dumb minded. <laughs> so I let you choose. And well, if you have to questions, well, think about beans. <laughs> <laughs> dumb questions are great products. <laughs> okay, one final question, and you all. Okay. I'll follow up with another dumb question. Um, how did you even decide to go into like making cases? Was it like a chance, or is it something you were passionate about, or how did you even come into it? Well, the, the first product was just a waterproof case, so just a waterproof box, and I was making products for everybody else. So it was a contract manufacturer. Okay, yeah, I guess. And it was, I was sick and tired of, of watching people develop a product and then fail. And I had no control of it, yet I just spent all my time and energy as a business trying to help them get, get a product to market. And usually they failed on the, either the business side, so they didn't understand how to run a business. A lot of people come to me today and they go, well, I have an idea. So I'm like, well, do you want to create a product or do you want to create a company? Because they're two different things. And most people just had a product and an idea and thought, boom, I'll build the tools for it and it'll sell. Well, not true. And so I was tired of watching that, so I, I said, I gotta develop my own product line. 
so I can take a little more control of my destiny here as a manufacturer. And uh, got some traction with that with the OtterBox, and then elect electronics came into play. People said, I love the fact that this protects my PDA, but I can't use it through the case. Can you come up with a way to do that? Did that, patented that. And then along came, you know, the, the convergence of all those technologies, the PDA, the phone, the, I, the, the, the MP3 player, all that came together in really the iPhone. And, uh, and so to be able to, so we just naturally followed that, that digital revolution because we were already in that space. So that's how it, how it grew and that's how we got into protection. But there's lots of stories along right. the way of, you know, even even the first uh, BlackBerry case we made was huge. It was huge and bulky and, you know, management of, at Home Depot loved it, but the guy on the floor is like, I'm not using this thing, it's massive. You know, so that's really where the Defender came from for us was, okay, well, what do you want? Well, I want protection, some dust protection, I want drop protection, but I don't need water protection. Water's what makes it so big. Um, so at the end of the day, we came up with the Defender, and even today, the Defender's still half of our revenue. So. Will you help me uh, express our appreciation to <laughs>